Because of you, the Black Power Blueprint is rapidly moving forward, bringing a future of self-determination to the African community of St. Louis. With more than 800 contributions from you, we Thank you. 
We need your contributions to install the outdoor lighting and to pave and fence the lot to complete the beautiful outdoor venue space and the community hall. Because of you and our amazing volunteers, we are in the process of rapidly renovating the Fullpack Department building to house our African Independent Workforce Program that will train African workers returning to our community from the colonial prison system. Your generous contribution enabled the Black Power Blue Prayer to be on track for our launch of Phase 3, the renovation of our Uhuru Jiko Kitchen, Bakery, and Cafe beginning January. Hundreds of you from the white community have united with this opportunity to contribute as a powerful stance of reparation to the black community. We can see the beginnings of an entire community coming together for self-determination and power over our own lives. We really appreciate your continued support to make these economic institutions a reality for the people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Also important to uh, acknowledge that uh, to thank Ngoma uh, again. I mean, an extraordinary cultural performance, and also to acknowledge uh, the uh, uh, brother, comrade, brother uh, Kennedy, who uh, is an alderman here in the city of uh, of St. Louis, and has been a formidable force. Uh, for not not just as an alderman here, but in terms of the whole history and relationship to struggle uh, for our people. Uh, Rick Kennedy. All right. Oh. Oh, hold on. Yeah. 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 He might look a lot like, like this guy who was drumming. <laughs> He's his older brother. They're twins. I think, what, older about 15 minutes, something like that? 19 minutes? Okay. <laughs> Uhuru, a world of
fact of the matter is, if the brother is 19 min minutes older, he could have given permission to speak. <laughs> Uh -huh. All right, we would like that everybody get back in place, please get back in place. Um, these two chairs need to be switched. That's a timekeeper. That doesn't say anything. It's a timekeeper's chair. And everybody else, please move up so that as new people come in, they just have other seats available to them. Move up. All right. Uhuru. So my name is Alikia Ngoma, and I am the secretary of the Black is Back Coalition. And I want to welcome you again to... <laughs> to day one of our eighth annual conference. The theme is there is no peace. Africa and Africans are at war. U.S. to the world, comply or die. Yes, and um, how many people were here last night for the movie night? Yes. It was dope, okay. Um, so over the next two days, we are going to be hearing not only reports of the coalition itself, but we're gonna be engaging in you know, uh, various panels that speak to the theme and um, to African people. So right now what I'm going to do is introduce the coordinating committee as well as the steering committee members of the Black is Back Coalition. And I would like that once I say your name, you stand. And for those who are not here, we will get to see a picture of them um, on the TV up here. So first we have Omali Yeshatella, who is the chairman of the African People's Socialist Party, who also chairs the Black is Back Coalition. Uhura. Next, uh, you, may, you, you can sit. Yes. <laughs> Next, we have Sister Lisa Davis, who is the vice chair of the coalition. She also chairs the healthcare working group, and she's on as a member of People's Organization for Progress. Black is back. Black is back. Black is back. All right. Um, next to make part of our coordinating committee, which again is the committee that uh, that does the day to day work of the coalition, um, in between conferences and between events and things like that, we have the treasurer Osenu Mbenga. Uhuru. All right, next we have Elikia Ngoma, who is the secretary of the coalition. Uh, <laughs> yes, thank you. Thank you. All right, um, next we have Sister Betty Jo Soto, who is the membership coordinator. Up, uh, Uhura. All right, in the back we have Brother Timba Shabanda, who is the website and social media coordinator. We have Brother Omowali K. Fing, who is based in Houston. He is the media coordinator of the coalition. We have Glenn Ford, who is the co-founder, one of the co-founders of the coalition. He is also on as Black Agenda Report. Uh -huh. We have Brother Cam Howard, who is um, on as the Encobra, as well as the Amos T. Wilson Institute. He also chairs the Reparations Working Group. Uh -huh. uh, we have Brother Ajamu Baraka, who is on as Black Alliance for Peace. They actually joined last conference in August, so this makes their year anniversary. Yes. And just wanted to say that if any other people, I mean, a call to membership will be made later, but anybody wants to join or renew their membership, today is the day to do it. We have Brother Khalid Rahim, 
who is the chairman of the new African Independence Party. Uhuru. We have Brother Reverend Edward Pinckney, <laughs> who chairs the Black Autonomy Network Community Organization. Uhuru. We have Brother Zaki Baruti, who is the President General of the Universal African People's Organization. Sister Betty Davis, who chairs, who chairs the Education Working Group. And she's also a member of the New Abolitionist Movement. Brother Ralph Pointer, who chairs the Political Prisoner Working Group. And he's also a member of the Lynn Stewart Committee. Diop Olugbala. He chairs the Black Community Control of the Police Working Group. Sister Nellie Bailey, who could not be here today, she is a member of the Harlem Tenants Association. And um, we have another new member uh, who joined January of this year. His name is Ikimba Bomani Ojore. And he's a member of the Global Ubuntu Organization. So uh, once again, on behalf of the steering committee, we want to thank everybody for coming um, for this weekend's event. And we're going to move it forward to getting a report, a financial report, as well as a membership report. Uhuru. Uhuru. My name is Betty Jo, and I'm honored to serve in the capacity of the membership coordinator of the Black is Back Coalition. And I'm here to report on our membership as of, let's see, well, actually, my task as the membership coordinator is to activate and process membership and as well as um, connect members to the respective working groups because there are a variety of working groups as you will see as the program goes along. Um, since our last conference, we've had uh, a 25% increase in membership, which is really great considering um, it's just been a year. We have 71 individual members. We have 11 organizational memberships. Three of them have joined within the last year, um, and that would be Black Autonomy Network Community Organization, Reverend Pickney, Black Alliance for Peace, Ajamu and Global Ubuntu Foundation. Those three organizations join within this year here. Welcome, welcome. We appreciate all our members and all the work that they do in their respective working groups. It is amazing. And later we'll tell you how you can join as well. Uhuru. So the next thing on the item that I have is the presentation of the coalition's work since the last uh, so somebody needs to say something. Can't just that people have the same uh, program that I have. They won't know it. Uhuru. Uh, what we're going to do, uh, you're all looking at the program, make a, a change right now, and we're going to move forward with the um, health care working group report, which is Sister Lisa Davis, who chairs that committee, and followed by that uh, will be the Black Community Control of the Police by Brother Diab Obala, and we should be prepared to have our financial report uh, following those two reports, as well as the 
uh, presentation of the coalition's last year's work since our last conference. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And good morning, fellow comrades, how are you? Um, I just want to ask you to bear with me one second. I'm just looking for a quote that I have on my Kindle book, a very, very empowering quote, which I think sums up so much about um, the state of what we call health and, and health care um, in this country, and especially as it relates to African people. I want to first begin by paying homage to my wonderful mother who recently joined the ancestral realm. But it was her dedication and her tremendous contribution to the field of home health care that uh, planted the seeds and set the stage for so much of what I do and my vision as it pertains to, to health and to the health of our communities, and that's so important. Also, I want to pay recognition and homage to our um, ancestral brother, Francois Mackendall, who was considered to be, he was a revolutionary in the healthcare field, and he was considered to be the inspiration behind the Haitian Revolution. And one of the first people recorded as calling for the complete bringing down of this system of enslavement. And I think it's very, very important that we do that and that we acknowledge the revolutionaries in the field of health because so many times when we think about our great African warriors and liberators, oftentimes we don't think of the field of health. And that's, at, that's an error that we have to correct and it comes at a great disadvantage to us because our ancestors, they had an understanding about health and healing that goes, that goes completely, completely contradicts what is now considered health care. And unfortunately, because we don't have that knowledge, because we don't have that connection about the way, we don't have it the way we should have it, about the healing powers of the earth, the healing properties of the earth, and our relationship to this earth with that, because we don't have that knowledge, because that has been obliterated from our memory, we have allowed this barbaric system of what they call medicine to replace it. Yes. And no matter how we look at it, shape it, or form it, yes. the same hospital system, the same structure, was born out of the same system of genocide and enslavement. And they played an active role in that. I'm going to see if I can find this quote real. Well, if I, if I can't find the quote, I'll just I'll reference it. But it was um, a quote from a book called uh, The American um, Uprising, The Untold Story of America's Largest Slave Revolt, although the largest slave revolt that happened on in this country was uh, the, um, the Civil War, and I think we need to start calling it as that. But in this quote, they talked about, uh, this was a, a slave revolt that had happened on, in an area that was referred to then as the German coast, which is now known as Louisiana, an area surrounding that. But you had at, at least 500 enslaved Africans who had gathered and had just wreaked as much terror as they could and revolted against the enslavers. And one of the people that they targeted and that they attacked was the local doctor. And the author of this book said, you would think that they probably would not do that, you know, the local doctor, because you know, we perceive doctors as being helpful to us. But because the doctors were brutal, many people who were enslaved did not view them as helpful or as healers. They, they um, just practiced such a brutal system of medicine on our people. But anyway, they targeted and they killed him. And I was like, yes, I'm glad they did. Um, 
I'm going to uh, start, I know I don't have that much time and there's so much to be said, but I want to start by talking about something that recently happened because I think that's very instructive and it shows the vision of the healthcare working group and also shows some things that we need to make sure that we're doing in here. But uh, not too long ago, one of our fellow comrades, a very, very strong member, a strong member of the People's Organization for Progress, Brother Aminifu Williams, some of you have seen him, um, he had a stroke, he had a stroke at the pop meeting. I didn't even know what a stroke looked like. And I'm sitting there and just noticing that, um, you know, he's not doing certain things, but he's sitting up and stuff like that. And then after the meeting, when I went over to him to ask how he was doing, he could not talk. And I'm standing, and I'm like, brother, I'm in he's like, blah, 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 and all of that kind of stuff. He couldn't talk. And um, because of certain modalities that I had learned about with energy healing, I learned that I always carry certain things with me. And my understanding is that no matter what happens with anyone, we all need this energy. And so I just began to practice, oh, five minutes, <laughs> so much time already. But anyway, I began to just practice these very non-invasive modalities with him. And um, I'm fortunate to say that he always could, could move and everything like that. But we had to rush him to the hospital. And so um, we didn't know his next of kin, I, or at least the next of kin was in, the, in Las Vegas. And I wanted to make sure that I went there with him because I wanted to be on record as somebody who came into the hospital with him. That's a very important position. And be, have it, being on record as doing that, I wanted to also clearly establish that although I was not the next of kin, there were people who were around him who cared. So that meant you could not do whatever you thought you could do. And also with that kind of relations, with that kind of being on record like that, it also helped me to establish a relationship with his brother who we were able to contact and to track down. And I made it a point to try to go every single day as often as I could. Your eyes and your ears matter when you're in the hospital system. It matters. It is imperative to establish a certain kind of record to be able to say, oh, this is how he came in on Monday. This is how he is on Tuesday. And this is how he is, you know, tomorrow. And also to clearly establish that kind of informal relationship with the hospital system and not just to establish it, but also to monitor and question everything. And I made sure to establish a relationship with his brother and to get permission from his brother. I told him, I can be your eyes and your ears. I know you can't be that you're in Las Vegas, but I would love to play your, to be your eyes and your ears and to report back to you every time I go. And he said, yes, I could. And I got permission to ask questions. And so therefore, um, I began, I immediately asked questions about the medications and wanted to know what they were giving him. And I'll just give you one brief example. They came and said they had to do some kind of emergency procedure. I completely disagreed with that, but that's another you know, whole story altogether. But, um, and then when they gave him this emergency procedure, they had cut open his neck, only gave the family 15 minutes to make any kind of a decision, but they had cut open a vein in his neck. And so the next day I had gone back to see him and because I knew how he was on that day, I knew how he was before they did the procedure and I could see how he was afterwards. And I noticed that they were giving him this medication called heparin. Heparin, all medications are very deadly, but heparin definitely has serious side effects, one of them being hemorrhaging. And so I said to the nurse, you're giving him, hem you're giving him heparin and you know that can cause internal bleeding. And she said, oh, no, 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 everything is, everything is good, everything is good, everything is good. The next day I get a call from his brother saying that they have to go back in and do another procedure because of internal bleeding. I was immediately able to say to his brother, well, you know, they're giving him heparin. And one of the side effects of heparin is that it causes hemorrhaging. And I was able to send this documentation because I did research on it. And I wanted his brother to feel comfortable to at least know I'm not just saying this. And when I do my research, I like to do research from their sources. So I was able to submit to his brother what their sources were saying about it. And he did bring it up to the hospital and they did pull heparin from him. And um, all throughout that time, you had people like myself and other people. He's such a strong figure in the community who had literally wrapped ourselves around him. And we were reporting back and forth to each other every single day. And when one of us could not be there, the other one would be there. Many times, those of us who knew certain non-invasive modalities that are so integral to healing were doing these things. We were giving him proper nutrition, massage therapy, 
energy. And I'm happy to say that he had regained his speech. He had regained at least 80% of his speech the day after it happened. And he was always able to move. That is not the normal trajectory that I'm aware of when it comes to stroke victims. But we want to build out this healthcare working group. We think that we should be there for everyone. We want people to understand the things that we can do, the power that exists in your hands, the power of food, and to know, and especially if you are involved in the movement, but it should transcend to everybody in our community. But hopelessness is not the way you have to go. And you must, you yourself must monitor the medications that they give in those hospitals because they prescribe them recklessly. I know I don't have too much time, but I want to now transition into some of the things that the healthcare working group is doing to help sort of change uh, this uh, climate, because we must do it. The power is in our hands, nobody else's. And we have a strong, wonderful history of healing. We must bring that to the fruition. Um, point 14 of the Black is Back 19 point national black political agenda for self-determination is free, universal quality health care for all. I have some copies right here of something that we've worked on and we put before the health care working group and that they did adopt. But when we talk about health care, and I know my time is up, so I just want to say this, health care is, is about far more than affordability. Because I'll tell you right now, even if I could afford what they call health care with this system, I would reject it. So when we talk about health care, health insurance is one aspect of it, and yes, we should have that. It should be public. No one should be allowed to make any kind of profit at all from our um, health and from sickness. That should not be. But we cannot stop there with just talking about affordability because we have to completely redefine and re-envision what, what they call health care because it is anything but a health care system. Thank you so very much. I have copies of this, which um, I will uh, make sure it's, you know, I put it on the table in the back. And just one other campaign we're working on, the issue of Depo Prevera and how they are injecting our communities with deadly birth control. Brothers and sisters, please, there's information on the back table about this. Thank you so much, but please also pass this out. Thank you. Uh -huh. Uhuru. My name is Diop Ulubala. I'm the chair of the Black Community Control of Police Working Group, and I'm just going to give a report on uh, the work we've been involved in for the last year. Uh, we have a PowerPoint. I have to be self-critical because I wanted to have a new one for you. This is a very similar one to last year's report, but I'm going to report on more recent activities verbally as well. And I also, just before anything, I want to recognize uh, Comrade uh, Robin uh, Harris uh, out of uh, Orlando, Florida, who is uh, steadily building the Black Community Control of Police Working Group there and has been doing some very important work in that arena as well as on the electoral front. And, uh, of course, my comrade uh, Rashid Holmes, who traveled with me from Philadelphia, uh, who's part of our working group on that front as well who has been really instrumental in uh, advancing the goals and objectives of this uh, important campaign in Philadelphia and, and creating a model that can be duplicated throughout the country. And uh, as you can see, the, the PowerPoint here is entitled Ballot in the Bullet, but uh, it should be entitled uh, uh, Africa and Africans are at war. There is no peace uh, as this conference is theme. Uh, but we do understand that and we are uh, rapidly working to build this working group and to take uh, this important campaign to the masses of the people. Uh, also, you should know that in your registration packet, you will find some important documents, part of the Black Community Control of Police uh, kit. Uh, for one, you have the resolution, the City Council resolution. Uh, uh, also, uh, you'll find the petition in your uh, folder, and I, I'm not sure if, I don't think you have them in your hands, but at the table in the back, there's also the Know Your Rights cards. And those are the three main uh, instruments uh, of our campaign that uh, we call on uh, our forces to do on a regular basis, wherever you may be located. 
So uh, I don't see the PowerPoint, but it's it's okay. So I'm gonna go over first of all the goals of the campaign, and then I'm gonna go over the objectives in terms of how we plan to advance those goals. So primarily, the goal of the Black Community Controller Police campaign is the immediate withdrawal of the colonial occupying military force from the Black community, uh, also known as the police. We understand that the police, as is the entire uh, domestic colonial state apparatus was established to protect the system of slavery, colonialism, and parasitic capitalism. Uh, and in plain words, the police is the instrument that the white ruling class uses to keep black people separated from the resources and the labor that's been stolen from us. That's, that was a case uh, when we brought the Africa in chains. Uh, if you ran away, it was the police that would come to capture you. And that is the uh, situation today uh, where you find the police occupying forces in our community all over this country uh, that make sure that Africans don't have access to uh, our resources in the form of food and the supermarkets and housing and, and, and clothing, et cetera. So uh, the, the, all of which has been produced by our own black labor as well as the labor of other oppressed peoples and uh, the police also function as that apparatus to uh, prevent uh, and to criminalize uh, the uh, organization of black people uh, who would uh, uh, strike out for our freedom so uh, you know this is uh, we say they got to go uh, the police do not uh, represent anything positive in our community and uh, we want to win the mass of the people to understand that uh, the police got the go. And as uh, the party introduced this important and catchy slogan, pigs in your hood ain't no good. So uh, uh, so that's, uh, uh, and then concretely, uh, another goal is uh, and when we talk about black community control of the police, objectively, uh, we're talking about uh, uh, building the capacity to hire, fire, train, and discipline or prosecute and or subpoena uh, police forces that violate the rights of the people. Uh, and so if we establish that, that in the final analysis, that equates into the withdrawal of the occupied military force because the black community, if we had uh, the democratic uh, ability to uh, control and to determine who the armed forces in our community were and what they do, then objectively that translates into the withdrawal or the expulsion of the pigs from our community. Uh, but at the same time, uh, this democratic demand for the right to hire, fire, uh, train, prosecute, and also uh, to establish a democratically elected Black Community Control of Police Commission. This also is consistent with the logic that's put forth by the colonial government uh, through its electoral process where they claim that the people have uh, the right to vote for everything that goes on in their community. Well, if that is true, then the people should have the right to determine uh, who the quote-unquote police in their community are and what they do. So this is uh, the genius of the demand for black community control of the police. It's a revolutionary demand and that is calling for the, the pigs to be uh, forced out of the community, but it's also a democratic demand in that it uh, exploits the uh, principles uh, which are already hypocritical, but it exploits the principles that are uh, 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 used and articulated by the U.S. government itself. Uh, slide. So another uh, important demand is the right to armed self-defense of the black community. Uh, we understand in the final analysis that real power is not, not, it's not something that can be given to an oppressed people. Real power is something that must be seized. And we understand that the police uh, function in the black community in the same way that the U.S. Uh, military functions in Afghanistan and uh, Africa and uh, 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 oppressed territories throughout the world. And uh, we understand that uh, black people should not limit their understanding in terms of how to resist to uh, the law that is introduced by our oppressor. We understand that, and in fact, the same law, the Second Amendment says the uh, people who have the right to bear arms and use them against a tyrannical government. So if that is the case, then black people should be allowed uh, to take up arms against uh, a terroristic, tyrannical police force that clearly wages uh, war against black people on a regular basis in the cities like St. Louis and uh, countrywide. So uh, slide. 
Uh, now, when we talk about the objectives uh, in terms of how we intend to achieve the goals of the Black Community Control Police Campaign, one, like we said, we have the city council struggle, uh, which uh, we are calling for our forces wherever we are located uh, to struggle with your local city council to adopt the resolution for black community control of the police. And this resolution, again, it calls uh, for the ability for the black community uh, to have its own democratically elected black community control of police commission that would have the power to hire, fire, train, and prosecute. So we are also looking at the power to prosecute and also also to overturn uh, the prosecutions and convictions that have been imposed on our people and have resulted in the mass imprisonment of black people. So uh, wherever you are, we encourage you, as we see it happening in North Carolina, uh, to go to your city council and make this struggle openly for the government that you elected or supposedly uh, elected to adopt this important resolution. Slide. Also, uh, we carry out petition work, uh, which you can also find in your packet. And this petition, essentially, when somebody signs it, it is an expression of their unity with the demand for black community control of the police and can be used when you go to the city council as a demonstration of the type of support that the people have for this demand. So when you go to city council, you're not just as a handful of forces, but you're coming with as many forces as you can, as well as stacks and stacks of petitions that say, look, your constituency signed this petition uh, for this particular uh, resolution. And it also serves, obviously, as a contact sheet so that if people are interested in joining this campaign, we can follow up with them. It has email address information and phone number. Slide. Uh, also, an important campaign, uh, the X aspect or the objective is to take this demand on the road, to popularize and spread out the gospel of black community control of the police throughout the country. So those of you who are from various cities, I want to really encourage you to join the working group and uh, to carry out this campaign and function under the leadership of the National Organizing Committee of, of the Black Community Control of Police Working Group. If you're interested, you can contact me. Uh, and I'm, I wanted to say a couple things, uh, slide. Uh, uh, let's hold it right there. So uh, some things that we have been trying to develop in Philadelphia and hope to see duplicated elsewhere uh, is, you know, really uh, black community control of police in action, not only in terms of distributing the Know Your Rights cards, which, uh, again, you'll find in the back table, uh, not only in terms of the petitions being signed in the city council work, but whenever possible, we want to uh, recruit the uh, observation and participation of the masses of the people in this process of gaining power. Because at the end of the day, we know that uh, uh, it is only through the power of the people. When the people internalize this demand and begin uh, to build the Black Community Control of Police Commission, uh, in their communities based on the understanding we've introduced through the outreach and whatnot. So one of the things that we have begun to introduce and you'll be hearing a lot more about is the Black is Back, Black Community Controller Police, Black Fist Cop Watch Program, where we go out into the community, essentially patrolling the community, doing outreach, distributing the Know Your right, Rights cards, and at the same time, when we see the police harassing Africans, we want to intervene, particularly around this question of the Fourth Amendment. As you know, the issue of stop and frisk is a serious uh, question where police routinely just run up on black people without any probable cause or reasonable uh, uh, suspicion to, uh, you know, support. Because in the court of so-called law, if they even find something on you, whether it be weapon or drugs or any other contraband, the police have to demonstrate that they had probable cause or reasonable suspicion to conduct the stop and the search in the first place. But nine times out of ten, they don't. And uh, but the people need to be armed with a certain kind of understanding of how to deal with that contradiction. And so. Whenever we see Africans being harassed in the streets, we want to simply introduce ourselves, Black Community Controller Police Working Group, and we want brothers and sisters to inform you of your rights. Here's the Know Your Rights cards we hand out to the people, the observers, et cetera. And at the same time, uh, we want to be able to follow up with that African that's being jammed up. And, um, you, know, uh, object, you know, at the final analysis, 
Our goal is to win the people to a certain understanding that what we are living under is not a democracy. As the theme of this uh, conference states, it's a comply or die kind of situation where you either uh, do what the pig says or you get thrown in handcuffs. And if you uh, don't uh, comply with that, you uh, uh, face the real possibility of being killed. And so uh, we want to expose that to its core. Uh, through this type of work uh, to expose the dictatorship and therefore lead Africans to the correct understanding that the real solution is to pick up the gun, uh, to wage uh, a real revolutionary struggle uh, to force the, the pigs, the military occupation out of our community. But again, this can only be done through the willing participation, the conscious participation of the masses of the people. And so this type of work is extremely important. But we as a black, black community control of police working group, the black Black Fist program, Black Fist, Fist standing for foreign and internal security team. By foreign, we refer to the military occupation. So security against that uh, is a question of wanting the people to understand they got to go. Internal security is dealing with the question of organizing the people to overturn the contracts, uh, contradictions that exist am amongst each other. Uh, uh, through reason and political education and organization to end the horizontal violence, the drug usage, and other contradictions that undermine our ability and capacity to resist against the real enemy, which is the U.S. government and colonial state. And lastly, I just want to say that we've been involved in some really important work, I'm, I'm sorry, Conrad, around the prison question, because as part of our resolution states, we call for the right uh, for the power to prosecute of the police and other uh, state officials who violate the rights of the people. Uh, but also that right to prosecute calls for the right to overturn the prosecutions that have been imposed on our community that result in over 2 million Africans being locked up in prison right now. And so in Philadelphia, we engage in a few different campaigns to organize the families, friends, and neighbors of Africans who have been, quote unquote, wrongfully convicted. And uh, we've been making struggle with the so-called Conviction Integrity Unit, cases like that of Calvin Brown, William Johnson, uh, uh, Leon uh, Garland, and others. Uh, uh, we are organizing around these cases, and we want to uh, you know, uh, deepen that work as well. Uhuru. Uhuru. They're going to be up, there's going to be an opportunity for people on the agenda to make their presentations. This was just to be a report from the different groups. That's all. It was not to be in the, yeah, you go, there's, go, there's a place on the agenda for people to make their presentations. You understand from the, yeah, Uhuru, yeah. And the reason that's important is because we're scheduled here for 12 o'clock to have a tour. The bus is going to pull up here. We're going to take a, a sack lunch, a bag lunch with us to that tour. And I don't want us to overextend the time thing. Also, it helps to exercise a little bit of discipline. Uhuru. <laughs> that was a great presentation. Thank you. Yeah. Uhuru. Uhuru. I appreciate it though. All right, so I'm here to give the uh, financial report of the coalition. Um, the Black is Black Coalition is a membership-based organization is how, I, how we make our resources. Um, as stated earlier, that at the annual conferences is where organizations, either people get to join the coalition, you can do that throughout the year too, but organizations typically renew their membership um, at this event during the call for membership. So. Um, for the past eight years, the black is back, has been in the black, financially speaking. And, um, you know, the rates for membership are if you are an individual, one year, $25, two years, $50, three years, $75. For local or state organizations, yearly, $50. National, $150. Or international organizations, $200. And um, with all of the expenses that we had to go through to put on this wonderful conference, our current balance is at $178.87. So we still do have some resources left over even after being able to um, pull this off. But of course, with the call for membership and call for resources, we're gonna help raise that up. Uhuru. We have a deficit. 
Yeah. Uh, King, do you want to help? Oh, Samuel, who is the yeah. treasurer, is not, is not here. I thought we would have had a, a report from him. This is what he just sent in? That's the one he just sent in? Yes. I understand that we have a deficit. But we're going to make that up today at some point. Um, with the help of everyone here uh, in this room. So as uh, Alikia was saying that we are a membership-based organization, uh, we do have uh, the balance that was stated before is correct, but we are, however, um, $1,200 uh, in the red. So before this day is over, um, we'll be counting on you to make sure that we're not, but we can say, that in terms of covering our finances, that the Black is Back Coalition for Social Justice, Peace and Reparations uh, for the past eight years with your support through membership um, has allowed us to be able to uh, make sure that we're able to take care of all of our uh, all of our expenses. So we know that you'll be able to help us do that today and we will provide a more clear and concise um, report to the membership of Uhuru. When, when is that going to happen, Comrade? We will have. Uh, we got one thousand two hundred dollars in the red. So, you know, can you say more than that? <laughs> because uh, yeah, just let people know what the status is, if you know. Well, I know that we will have a call. This is this uh, every organization that is here today that has not renewed their membership should be renewing their membership uh, today. And we're encouraging other individuals. There's going to be something that I'm sure there's something that you will that will motivate you one to become a part of this organization. And before this day is over, we will be able to tell you how that uh, deficit will be resolved because it's going to take you renewing your membership here uh, to make that happen uh, and individual members to join. Uhuru. Uhuru, I want to offer self-criticism uh, as a chair of the coalition. This is the first time we've come to one of our events uh, in the red, as I understand it. And I think we should have a better explanation for that. I mean, I expect we will raise money. We have to while we are here. Uh, but Kamar Osenu, who is the treasurer, uh, should have sent a comprehensive report uh, to this meeting since he knew he was not going to be here. So I'm offering a self-criticism before the conference is over, we'll be able to say something more comprehensive uh, about uh, the state of the uh, situation uh, financially for uh, the coalition. And I assume we will raise the money here uh, to cover the deficit. But I didn't even know what the extent of the deficit was. I thought I understood what our situation was until I just heard that. So we'll clarify that before this conference is over. Uhuru. Where are we now in terms of the agenda? Um, reports from Betty Davis and Ralph Winter. Ralph Winter first. Oh, okay. Thank you. Okay, Uhuru, brothers and sisters. Now, I notice at every meeting when the talk about the time of the presenters, just before I present, the chairman gets up and says, watch your time. And so I see the sign 10 minutes there, and I'm almost speechless. <laughs> but I want to say, some 58 years ago, Queen Mother Moore said to me, and I was young, if you're going to be in this work, your only reward is going to be the people you meet in this work. Yeah. And so I say to Chairman, you have presented me with a great reward as I look around yeah. to the people who are here today. And the other thing Queen Mother Moore said to me is you get one minute of speaking time for one day of working time. 
And so I try to keep that in mind. And you say, well, what have you done recently? Well, I take credit for Sister Betty Davis who's sitting there. And, and she tells me, don't ever say that. And I'm going to tell the truth. And for 50 years, she worked a full-time job, living in a one-bedroom apartment and contributing the rest of her funds to the movement. Yes. And thank you. And the only reason that she now is in a home of her own is because a comrade embarrassed me. Yes. 15 years ago, when he says, well, where are you living, Sister Betty? And she said, in the same place, and he looked at me and said, surely she has contributed enough well, for you to make sure that she gets a place well, of her own. Right the, the, uh, uh, the result of your labor, you have to have something for the result of your labor, or you are a slave to your work. And so, what have we done recently? And I say, we have continued to support our political prisoners at night and day at home and away. How do we do that? And we have a program, a blog talk radio program. And somebody said, why do you have that? And I says, because we say things that nobody else can say. They'll allow me on their program for a few minutes, but that's it. And so to say, give the truth, to talk about where we are today, we are in the position of the final solution. And if you look at the history of the final solution of people, you can just follow the progress. And I remember a few years ago, um, at a program in Boston, uh, the leader of the uh, American Indian movement, one of the leaders, Ward Churchill, made an outline of what happened to the indigenous people in America and what's going to happen to the Palestinians. It's real. It's true. It has happened. And here we are today talking about movement and going places. And we are in a position of the final solution. And the final solution is for us to be gone. Yeah. Miseducation, no help. Etc. And I've been getting the sign by my dear sister here that I'm running out of time. What have we done? Well, we've continued. We focused on three political prisoners this year. And even though many people in the movement say, Ralph, you're too caustic. Keep Ralph away from your movement. He's going to say things that's going to anger the government. Well, I can say they're out. We focused on them and they're home. <laughs> And we're going to continue that focus because you all know of Reverend Pinckney. Well, yeah. We brought Reverend Pinckney here. We're going to take credit for that. Reverend is here with us. And to continue this, this presentation, I'm going to ask my dear brother, Jihad, to come up, introduce himself. What was it, 27 years in? 27 years. Yeah, we'll come, come up, up and, 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 and talk, and I'm going to give my time. Oh, I didn't know this, but uh, thank you, uh, Comrade Ralph, and, and my dear beloved Chairman O'Malley, and each and every one of you. Right, no, I just want to give a report <laughs> on, which is very uh, basic. Um, you know, uh, I am the chairperson of the National Jericho Movement, and uh, with so many of us in here, including uh, Sister Betty and Ralph, um, we work on the campaigning to release political prisons, which we'll talk more about tomorrow. Uh, but uh, Herman Bell did come home a couple of months ago. Yeah. <laughs> Debbie Sims Africa came home a month ago. Yeah. And Robert Seth Hayes came home a month ago. No, speaking with these um these comrades, you know, the basic need was, you know, for lack of a better word, I'm choking on reentry. That's a, <laughs> but um, we were able to send them a significant amount of money to help them 
But um, there is an important thing that we need to keep in mind and, and as we go along with this very powerful conference is that we cannot abandon, leave, or forget about those comrades that put themselves on the front line. Right. As I heard comrades tell me today that they are on the front line, but lo and behold, if you got busted, popped, or go to jail, yeah. that we don't help you. Right because if I got that feeling here, I'm going home right today, right, right now, that right if I got arrested today, right that we, we would have programs about empowerment and helping each other and all of these type of things and controlling the police and all this. And I got jammed yeah. because I put myself out there yeah. and you don't help me. Yeah. I'm out. Yeah. Right. That's the deal. Yeah. So we got comrades that's been in prison now for 40 some, 50 some years. That's right. Rochelle McGee, he's in 50 years in that's prison. Right. That's right. And we can't forget them. So uh, as we move on to this conference, I want you to realize that no freedom fighter left behind. That's right. Absolutely not. And we're going to get them out. And we're working to get them out. And we have tremendous victories uh, this year. Not, not to, you know, just to encourage us that we got to get everybody out of prison. Right. And those defenses that my brother said to prevent that from happening by putting those defenses up against that front line that they have, the police. Right. All power to the people. We have a minute left. <laughs> uh, Brother Jihad, he may not know he's going to be a member because we're going to pay for that. <laughs> we're going to take care of that. And understand that we, and I'm going to talk about this later, must stop practicing political slavery and you practice political slavery every time you cast a vote for someone who doesn't support our political prisoners no more stop that that's right and, and so I, I i've been given several signals and my time is up and so i guess i'll stop here <laughs> I apologize, but you know, um, some of us, we get old, uh, we got so many stories inside of us, and it's hard once you give us a mic. You really need to stand up here with a gun when you give us a mic. <laughs> but I want Sister Soto in the back to start my presentation, because she's been doing a, a Black is Back uh, Herculean task, uh, organizing a street library. So I just want to give her w one minute to give her report because that's big education <laughs> issue. So sister, you come up and you'll start and I'll finish it because we had some tremendous victories for community control of education. And I can do it in one minute. Go ahead, sister. Uhuru, well, this is definitely a surprise and I don't want to take up Sister Betty's time. Um, okay, well, we, I've been working, I've been tasked with creating, with putting together the Omalia Shatella Resource Library. And this is um, Chairman's lifelong collection, I believe, of who he is today. And um, that library is there to relieve the community of the oppression that is, that the brainwashing that has been placed on them through education. And I am a teacher and I'll come back later with the membership report, I mean membership call, and I'll let you know about that as well. But this library is amazing. It, it will be done when we go back to St. Uh, to St. Petersburg. <laughs> All right, so I just want to thank her because she allowed me, she included me in the conversation. And as a librarian um, and um, former principal and teacher, I appreciate being able to, sh to share anything that I've learned that helped us have victories. I've never had a school that wasn't successful. That didn't stop them from <laughs> transferring me. Um, if you know the history of successful black educators, you know that when they have success and they are politically correct, right they get transferred. Right and so I was put in what they call the rubber room. And when I left, my school had something like a 67% attendance when it had been down to, I'm sorry, it had a 87% attendance when it started off with like a 50% attendance. And they had improved 15% in math and something like 20% in reading. And the reason I know these statistics 
is that someone who worked in the bureaucratic central board called me when I was in the rubber room to tell me these are the statistics. They're not going to publish them, but we right. have them on file. Right. So the agenda that brother uh, the Chairman Yoshitelli is, is working on is an important agenda. You cannot have education last because the slaves fought for that first. And if you look at any of the documentation, the uh, documentary history of the Negro by Apthecker tells you that. Uh, that's what they fought and died for. And the first thing the Black Congressional Congress did was give you, the community, control over your education because they understood uh, that slavery and education are incompatible and that's coming from Frederick Douglass. Yeah. So now to our victory in New York City, they are doing what they are doing in Chicago. It's the hammer and the anvil. They are, I can't curse, but they're effing up our public school system. <laughs> And they're setting you up to fail. And if you don't push back, then you will fail. Because they'll take out the people who are positive in your schools, they'll set them up and give them U ratings. In New York City, black police and teachers get 80% of the U ratings. 80%. All right. And any professional that feel that we go in that is direct service to the community, they take it over and corporatize it. And this is why you have to fight back, because as I've told you before, cats don't educate mice, they eat them. So there is the top school in our community, which is the, still the blackest neighborhood in Brooklyn. Thank you. I appreciate that. You were supposed to do that. Um, <laughs> the top school, PS 25. It's in what we call Bed-Stuy, and Bed-Stuy is still a little black. Most of Brooklyn that was black is now chocolate chip, but Bed-Stuy is still black. It's the top school in the district. What am I doing here? You're all right. Yeah, yeah. Okay, the top school in Brooklyn, just because I'm fat, let me move. Um, all of the indicators that the Board of Ed used to say, what is a good school, this school is. They are trying to close it because they claim it's underutilized. Mm -hmm. Now, meanwhile, this is a district when close to 80% of the schools are failing. So the solution should be right to let the parents in those other schools transfer to this school and keep this school open. Now, this is significant because this is one, this is the second time in less than a year that they have tried to close a successful school. And both times uh, our New Abolitionist Movement joined with the parents to keep the voice open that Black is Back talks about. And you have to understand what you say when you say Black is Back. Yeah. You are talking about the right to, to, to your own view of reality. Yeah. Nobody can impose yeah. their concept of reality on you. Yeah. And part of your reality is your history and your yeah. I'm going to curse you can see. Your culture. And so this is why black is back is important. I don't, I think it's, you know, that phrase is not one of my favorite ones, but I say it because you say it. But you need to understand what you are saying. You are saying you started history. You started culture. And be damned if you're going to let what they call Western European civilization well dehumanize and decivilize you. And that analysis uh, comes from a, a brother who wrote about the decivilization of Africa. And you really need to, to, to investigate that. The point is, the judge decided in our favor, but it's only a year for a year. And this is how the, the system fights you. They will give you a temporary victory when you show a force, hoping that you will go to sleep and you will go away but you have to keep the pressure on. And you have to make the parents understand that a victory is never a victory until you own it, until you control it. And community control of education yeah. is legal. Yeah. This is one battle you can win, whereas community control of the police is not, because nobody's gonna give you control over their army. You got to take control of their army. So that's one victory. The other victory we had was the school it's a K through 12, uh, six, grade six through 12 school. It is the top school in New York City. It is the top school in New York State. It is the 12th best school in this country. And they want to close it by saying the parent standards are too high and they need to lower their standards. And this is the term they use. You don't let children 
of parents who've been incarcerated into your school. So the parents pushed back and said, we don't ask them if they've been incarcerated. If they meet the criteria, if they pass the test, we let them in. We have yeah. never asked them. Right. However, you should know, 80% uh, of our parents uh, are below the poverty level, yeah. and we think that might include some people who have been incarcerated. Right. Everybody knows the, uh, the, the, the uh, demographics of a black community in the heart of a black yeah. uh, town. So we won that temporarily. The point about community control of education is the point about any struggle that all of you are invo involved in. Uh, you use it to educate, but you also have to deal with the black misleadership class. Because the first thing the most corrupt black politician did was come in there with some money and talk to some of the parents, and they think they have won a victory. So we have done battle number one. We're not saying the battle is over. And I'm going to conclude because I will be talking about the rest of the adventures uh, that we're involved in. But I have two documents I'll put out there where we talk about what is control. Yeah. And one of the initiatives we're fighting is mayoral control. Yes. The people in Chicago know that they can't trust uh, that creep that was with Obama, Rahm, Rahm Emanuel. And they are pushing back, and we are in communication with them. One of the brothers who presented on your panel last year used some of the principles that he, we discussed here. He got an election, he won it uh, and on a local level, and he uh, united and organized within his union to push back against the closing of the public schools in Chicago. You know more than 80% of the public schools in Chicago have been closed, and you know what's going on with the death of the children at the hands of the police. The two things go hand in yes, hand. So along with community control of police, you got to have community control of education. And um, the last but not least, we're organizing to stop the police uh, teachers with guns. Uh, there's a petition online, and we are supporting that. So we have two documents that will be on the table. We'll hope you'll take a look at it and develop some strategies. Thank you. Uh -huh. What do we have? What otherwise will we have on the agenda? Well, that's a 10 minute report, right? Yeah. So why don't we go there and while the thing is rendering? Can I render by this report is being done? If it's 10 minutes, perhaps you, yeah, I have one. There's an, an issue with, uh, has been for a minute, I don't quite understand it, but I'm a dinosaur when it comes to stuff having to do with social media. But there's a, a video or something yes. that has to render. It's been rendering for a while. It's sort of like freedom, I guess, but <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we're trying to with, manipulate the agenda. Can this happen while the video is rendering? Yes. Can we? Okay, just let's do that. Uh -huh. So our next set of reports will be um, from the candidates that were uh, endorsed by the Black is Back during our electoral campaign school, which took place on April 7th and 8th right here. Can anybody raise their hand if they were here for that? All right, good, good, good. So I'm going to start with um, reading what the process is for getting an endorsement. Then we're going to get a report from Sister Coffee Wright and then a report from Robin Harris. Okay, you have to order those on? 
Okay. <laughs> Can you introduce that? I mean, because uh, I'll stand with you for a minute. Well, I'm reading the protocols. Yeah, but what has happened is that now we have endorsed candidates now for at least two years. We endorsed Chokwey uh, uh, and made a contribution to his campaign. And, uh, but at our last, at a steering committee meeting that we had a couple of months ago, uh, we were concerned, it came up that we don't have a protocol as a coalition for endorsement. There have been people who we've seen say, we like them, they sound good, they, they unite with the National Black Political Agenda for Self-Determination, uh, but what protocol do we have? Do we have protocols? And that's what uh, a commission from the, uh, coalition uh, came together uh, comprised of whom? It was uh, Vice Chair Lisa Davis, mm -hmm. Nellie Bailey, Ajamu Baraka, and Khalid Rahim. Okay, and so they pulled together the protocol that we want to utilize henceforth uh, for being able uh, to endorse candidates as a coalition. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So number one is that candidates must sign a pledge to accept the 19-point platform for black self-determination. Uh, number two, once the BIB decides to endorse a candidate, the BIB will be prepared to do some of the following. Publicize their candidacy via our social media outlets and websites. Encourage the public to make donations to the campaigns. Offer boots on the ground resources when possible. Um, also decide to make monetary donations based on the candidate. Number three, candidates must be committed to independent Uh, independent electoral politics, even if they are running for strategic re uh, reasons on the Democratic Party line. Um, and a great example of that is um, Brother Charles and Sister Inez Barron. Number four, candidates must represent a real social base. Um, you know, for example, be a member of an organization, front, network, left alliance, and etc. Number five, if they don't belong to an existing organization, alliance, network, et cetera, um, that they have been endorsed by at least two recognizable and respected black radical organizations in their areas and or um, where they are nationally. Number six, um, the request for endor in endorsements should be in writing and should include a photo, campaign literature, uh, position statement, website and other social media sites, public contact information, information about elect election laws in the state in which they are seeking to win an election. They must um, embrace the BIB principles. They must be, again, committed to independent electoral uh, politics, have a real social base, and if not have a real social base, they must be endorsed by two known and respectable other black um, activists or black prominent figures in the community. So um, one of our endorsements was of, of Sister Coffee Wright. So we're gonna have a report um, from her about what has happened with her campaign since April. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Right there. Okay. Wow. Thank you, everyone. Okay, I get ten minutes. All right. <laughs> hey. Uh, first of all, I'm Coffee Wright. I ran for United States Senate for the state of Missouri. Hey, come on. Uh, thank you. I, I definitely, definitely have to give much thanks to the Black is Back Coalition for endorsing me and everyone that has given your support in any manner, whether it was spreading the word, whether it was passing out uh, some brochures, or, or if you voted for me, I thank you truly and appreciate you all. I definitely accept and recognize the uh, 19 points. 
I am a proud member of the Universal African People Organization, and I ran on the strength of truth to power. Uh, my, um, as you, if you've seen any of my forums that I spoke at, I've spoken at over 200 different places. And uh, my, my, um, I've never written out a speech, you know, because I figured the truth never changed. So I didn't have to, I didn't have to, um, you know. So anyway, um, as far as the campaign, you know, we hit it hard. We hit it hard. I mean, we literally slept three day, three hours a day, probably for the entire five months. And that's how we roll. We, uh, we traveled, we went to Kansas City back and forth probably about six times. We went to uh, Branson, I went to Branson one day on my own. Um, we went to Sison, we went to um, Cape Girardeau, we went to Jefferson City, we went to Columbia, and a uh, few other little, little cities, Phillipsburg, if you ever heard of that. I mean, little cities I had never even heard of. You know, that, that city is a little city off of 44 where the big candy factory is, but we went there. And we went, you know, I asked people, um, you know, what is it that they want to see when I become Senate? And I learned that we are uh, we're more alike than we are different in a lot of ways, family. You know, white people have their needs the same as us as far as universal health care. I met a little white girl in Branson. She looked like she was about 16 years old. She's about half the size of me. She's dying of cancer. She's 30 years old and have a 12-year-old daughter and no insurance. So universal health care is important for them, too. They have a homeless situation. As a matter of fact, we picked up 1,000 votes out of Branson. 1,000 votes, and I was only there for about six hours. Spoke to about 10 people. But I asked them to spread the word, spread the word, and obviously they did. So, um, you know, but the one thing that we, that they don't have in common with us, and that's our melanated skin family. It is not, you know, it's not a rumor, it's not um, uh, anything but the truth that we have issues that um, a lot of Americans don't deal with, and that's racism. And we and we tired of it. And so one of my main things that I was fighting on my platform, which I will continue to fight, I was fighting yesterday down in Ferguson. We back down there, shutting them down, and it was the anniversary of Mike Brown. But you know, universal health care is, is on my top list, but also community control of the police department. I can't say it enough with subpoena power. And that's something I'm fighting hard for. I'm fighting hard and, and we'll continue fighting hard for this mass incarceration for ending that because we know that that is a problem in our community and all the urban areas throughout the United States. So I thank you all so much for um, for supporting me and you know um, we um, uh, you know so many people that I know that ran for different positions right out here in St. Louis we just all got out and said we're gonna make a difference and I, and I looked and you know most of them whether they won or they lost um, you know, it was getting 2,000 to 3,000 votes. Well, family, I am, I am like overwhelmed. I don't feel like we lost because we made a difference. We opened some eyes and we challenged them, okay? But when I look at most people got two to 3,000 votes and then you got people who's been in office and they still maybe got 15,000, 20,000 votes. Family, we walked away with 40,971 votes and still count, okay? It ain't over. Still count. So I say thank you because Missouri has spoken. Missouri has spoken. And even though it rained, people got up and they got out and voted, and I appreciate that. But we just couldn't reach everybody, family. It was, it was pretty much five of us in five months with under $5,000, oh. okay? So just think about what could we have done if we had more people, more power, more boots on the ground. There's 112, there's 112 uh, political polls in just the city of St. Louis. There's another 200 and some in North County. Family, we, only, we didn't have the manpower. So we talk about sticking together. I need everybody to fight this fight with us. I need you to fight this fight. We donate just five hours, four hours, two hours. We need people to have poll control because it's important to have people at the poll. It is so important, you know? And so we was battling millions over morals and millions, millions outvoted us, you know? But we ain't scared That's right. and we ain't backing down. That's right. 
Okay, people saying coffee was next. I don't know right now. We haven't decided what's next. But I know I'm going to keep doing what I've been doing, and that's fighting for my people, right? So I say my time is about up. So I say power to the people. Power to the people. Power to the goddamn people. I'm copywriting. That's right. I said it. I just want to say that uh, Coffee Wright uh, and uh, UAPO, the uh, Universal African People's Organization, they they fought a hell of a battle uh, uh, here, and 40,000, 41,000 votes, nothing to sneeze at. Uh, with the with the resources they had to work with, you know, uh, that was an incredible battle. And I just want to congratulate you, comrade. Just really want to congratulate you, Uhuru. Yeah. Imagine if they would have had an honest voting system that counted the votes honestly, you'd probably have much more than that. <laughs> <laughs> so, 21 would like to be ranked number two. Right on. <laughs> 21, 21 candidates. 21 candidates. Is that... I'm going to count eight Democrats. They have an eight Democrats to be ranked number two. Ranked number two. All right. That's splendid. Yeah. Yeah. She ran against, uh, you know, uh, formidable force. I mean, she's been in office now for how many years? I've been in the political realm here for something like more than 30 years, the forces that, that she ran against. So, yeah. They had, they had uh, campaign manager, Clara McCaskill. Yes. They had 20-some million dollars. Woo! And as she said, we had $5,000. Yes, so, yes. Uh, that, was a, that was an incredible... Yeah, that's a great expression yeah. of black power. Right on. <laughs> So, uh, where are we now? Have we rendered? Chain still on. Okay. Robin Harris. Who's? Oh, we have a video from Robin Harris. Okay. She was another candidate. She's, uh, she came here from Orlando, Florida, and she won an endorsement from the coalition. Y'all remember her? Yes. Greetings, peace, and welcome to the to reach Can't hear. Hey, come man. Yeah. Can't hear it. Can you start it? Can you restart it? Greetings, peace. Um, it brings me great pleasure to reach out via uh, video to you uh, all. Um, I am Robin Harris, and uh, I am running for County Commission District 6 here in Orlando, Florida. Uh, my race is uh, NPA race, um, supposedly. Uh, and we're running here, and we're actually um, in the last day to vote. It's going to be August the 28th, 7 o'clock here. And um, so, of course, we've made qualification, and I want to publicly say thank you for um, for uh, the Black is Black Coalition endorsing me. Uh, it actually was a very pivotal moment um, in the campaign because it um, it was a great feeling to know that other candidates, other organizations, but especially candidates, um, embraced this and had this on their platform, and that all of us, no matter where we are. That we're running and we're and we're actually making a revolutionary move, um, no matter what race we're in. But we have this black agenda, and there are people, there are other sisters and brothers that I don't know, but we're all out there on the pavement and we're talking about uh, improving the lives of, of African people. So, um, with that being said, um, it is a head turner, especially with the with the millennials. Uh, and, and some older people too, but uh, especially with millennials, to see reparations uh, on my platform. It's on my postcard, mm -hmm. and it brings up great discussion. Uh, of course, some people aren't as uh, knowledgeable as to understand that we're not talking. We're way past talking about uh, with a mule and forty acres. That no, we're we're talking about being prioritized. And so many discussions around reparations, and I know that you guys know that best. So, but it's it's a head turner. It's a great conversation starter. 
puts a smile on the faces of many African people that I go out and talk to. Um, they smile and um, they, um, so asking for their vote makes it a little easier. Now, we'll see what happens at the polls though. So as I said before, um, this is an NPA race, but we have definitely had to do our police shenanigans. Um, so with that, I want to say some shout outs to, uh, uh, to Sister Betty Jo and Sister Lisa on yesterday. They saw me um, getting some really nasty, ugly pushback um, from the Orange County Black Dem, uh, the Democratic Black Caucus. Not that I'm trying to be a part of that or anything like that. However, there was a vote the ballot, vote the whole ballot um, literature, and it highlighted by color, uh, the green, I think by green color, uh, of all the black candidates to vote for. So guess who wasn't, guess who wasn't considered to be black? <laughs> a lot to say about that because it's just like the second or third time that something about the establishment and the status quo had happened. And so I sounded off and somehow it became my fault that um, that I wasn't acknowledged as black on this and a whole lot of ugliness came out. But I realized that um, anytime that we step against the petty bourgeois, um, uh, this imperialistic, parasitic folks, um, that we need to go and that's what we're supposed to do, whether we win or win the seat. Um, it's, it's, it's making these revolutionary moves and dismantling the system when we don't use so when we don't use the master's tools, it makes folks angry. It makes, it makes folks angry. So with that being said, I just want to kind of talk about some other endorsements that I did grab during this time. It was um, one from SEIU, Organized Florida, Conservative Ministers of Orlando. I don't know how in the world I got that. I have no idea. But um, we're thankful for it. Um, BSA, and we also snagged uh, early in the campaign from Natalie Jackson, who is an attorney, you may know her from the Trayvon Martin case. So we're very blessed and thankful. Um, and as I said, we're most grateful for Black is Back Coalition. When I was in Salt Lake City um, at a conference, someone stood up from California and said, I was on your website and I noticed the Black is Black Coalition and your 19 point uh, black, uh, political black agenda. And would you, his question to me was, would you, would you suggest that even non-African people embrace this. And it was a great time to be able to say yes, of course. So um, again, all the other things, the other places. And we, again, thank you. Um, if you'd like to make a donation, go to harrisforsix.org and click on donate. And if you'd like to volunteer, and if you're near the uh, Orlando area, we would love to um, have you come out. And so once again, uh, I really appreciate the support of the Black is Black Coalition and look forward to giving you a report um, after the primaries. Thanks. She said it was August, August 28th. Yeah. Listen, I just said this is the coalition. This is the, the strength of the coalition, the platform that we put forward to pull Africans from all kinds of different organizations and places to find the basis of being able to have some kind of unity around a common agenda, which is a thing that has eluded us for a while since the defeat of our revolutionary movement of the 1960s. And that's why this national black political agenda for self-determination was so important, right? <laughs> that's why it was so important. And, uh, so the coalition is being helpful in other ways. We are close to her in Orlando. We are less than two hours away. Uh, she has been uh, uh, to our headquarters in St. Petersburg. We've offered what assistance we have in terms of training, and then we're going to put boots on the ground with her uh, in Orlando as well. This is our coalition. Black is back, damn it. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, where are we now? We, uh, we have that place where, uh, uh, what I see, it, uh, there should have been a place here for uh, a call to membership and resources. Is that right? Let's go ahead and do that because uh, we're going to have to uh, leave here shortly uh, for the tour. So, Betty Jo Soto, Isabella. <laughs> 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 Chairman insists my name is Isabella, short for Betty, short for Isabella. <laughs> Elizabeth, in Espanol, no? Uhuru. Uhuru. Um, 
this is a point in our program where uh, we call to for everyone to participate. This is where you get to participate to make this happen, to continue to make this happen. Um, so, like I said, I was going to tell you that I've been teaching for over 25 years, and that's the reason why I've joined this movement here, is because the same thing that Betty Davis says is happening in New York is happening in St. Pete, and it happened to me in New York as well. When you're a good teacher and when you reach the children, they want to oust you out. But it's it's not it's not possible to totally totally oust me out because I have credentials. Yeah. Um, so I've seen the deepening crisis, and if you can control what you teach us, you can control where you lead us. Okay. So um, it's just a constant fortification, and that's why I'm here. And there's no need to reiterate all the horrors that has been going on. Sandra Bland, Trayvon Martin, Marquise McLaughlin, and all these other Africans who have been killed at the hands of the state. Okay, um, so without any, without further ado, I want to show you the nine years worth of work that the coalition has been involved in, and this is just some of the work that it's been involved in. Involved in. Okay, so Black is Back, we can come up with all these catchy phrases like Black Lives Matter, but if there's no demand behind that, you're just leaving us hanging. You're taking us to a dead end. So we demand, we have demands, and that's why black power matters. Our demands is for reparations. Our demand is universal health care. Stop gentrification. U.S. occupation in anywhere that the black community is at. Africa, Caribbean, America. It's the same occupation. Um, and as you can see, there's just so many more demands that we are making and we're fighting for. Drug wars here in the United States, free mum uh, mumie, mumia, yes, and Jamil is out already, Uhuru, and we still have many, many more political prisoners that need to be released. These are our demands. These two brothers, I'm so sorry. And the, the brother here? Oh, okay. Okay. Well, this is the work of the coalition. Okay, and you've already met the steering committee, but they're so wonderful that you can actually, we can go through them again. Chairman? Lisa, Elikia, Oseno, Timba, Betty Joe, Omawali Kafing, Glenn Ford, Nellie Bailey, Ajamu Baraka, Khalid Rahim, Zaki Baruti, Reverend Edward Pickney, Betty Davis, Ralph Pointer, Diop Alubala, Cam Howard, and Ikimba Bomani Ajuri. And these are our uh, steering committee members. Okay, so these are since 2009 to 2008, the campaigns that we've been involved in. And we've been persistent. This is our first maiden uh, march on the White House. And this year, um, marching, it, <laughs> as they marched down the streets, Africans didn't understand what really was going on until they realized what was going on. Obama, did, he was not the savior for black people. He, he was not. And I even thought I was so like, don't talk about my president because he he's black. Yeah. <laughs> well, right now, don't talk about my chairman. So, 
Yes, yeah, so this is our Made in March um, after they sat in the house for deliberating how this was going to come about. Okay, um, and this is the brother that we're still fighting for, and we're fighting for all political prisoners, especially, no, we're just fighting for all political prisoners. I'm not going to just say especially, especially for all, for all of them. Okay. Now, this event happened in, um, in defense of Haiti. It, European imperialism will never forgive Haiti for, for saying that we can be free and actually taking that freedom, okay? And um, so, um, yeah, we were marching in defense of Haiti. This year, BIB invaded um, Philadelphia, known to many of us as Philadelphia. And this is actually, it's, it's horrible that this was the city that actually bombed Move 9 in 1985, I want to say. And the governor, I mean, or the mayor, who is also black, said he would not hesitate to do it again. Okay. Mm-hmm. And I'm sure nothing's changed now because I've been hearing lots and lots and seeing lots and lots of stuff going on in Philadelphia. Okay. Um, and this international, Black is Back International Day of Action, it was just amazing how all corners of the world, everyone was united on this one action. Okay. Here, BIB initiates Break the Silence Against the Wars Being Held. Um, in the black community against black people. This was um, Break That Silence. Media does nothing to, um, to tell us what really happens in the community and how we can overturn that. Okay. And this is a, a march that we were in unity with the education workers in Newark, New Jersey. Education is key and we have to fight for the right to have an education black community control of education. And another outrage protest against police brutality and police terror in our communities. We will not stop. As the brother had said earlier, we want the right to, hi the right to hire, fire, and discipline police, right. especially in our communities. Yes. Okay. Absolutely. We should not be dying at the hands of the police. I have children, grandchildren. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, the, the coalition came together to um, campaign against Hands Off Asada after they added another million dollar bounty to her head. Obama. Well. <laughs> well. And simultaneously in St. Petersburg, um, Black is Back also rallied in front of the Holocaust Museum to stop Israelis' genocidal war on the Palestinians. Yep. And uh, as you heard earlier, we're comprised of many working groups, and the healthcare working group went out and made this demand that the attack on black women in our community via this Depro shot, Depo Provera shot. It, and I'm, I want to say that my daughter was taking this and she had to stop. She was, uh, she, she was going through some very serious reactions from this here. Horrible. Horrible. We need community control of health care as well. Okay, and this is the fifth year, um, the fifth international annual conference um, that was held in honor of Marcus Garvey's birthday. Um, yes, and we just and here is where we say Black Power matters. Black lives matters to who? Only to us. Black Power matters. And okay, this is where we um, protested and out, did outreach after Mike Brown was murdered, brutally murdered, and left there. And we went out and protested and out and did outreach for Mike Brown. Okay, and this is the actual demonstration that we did outreach for, March on Washington, D.C. 
black and brown forces came together to unite against this force, okay? That's our Spanish comrades. Spanish speaking comrades, thank you, Chairman. Yeah, mm -mm, mm, those are Europeans too. Um, and this is our BIB annual conference in Pennsylvania. It was held at the Uhuru Furniture Store in Pennsylvania under the theme Black Power Matters. This was the annual conference and here is the actual march on the White House that uh, took in Washington DC in that same year under the same Black Power Matters. Okay, this is uh, when we united um, the Baltimore uprising after the murder of Freddie Gray. We all came together and we um, marched against no justice, no peace. Right, uh, the Justice or Else rally in Washington, D.C., where um, we, were we were actually questioning what is the or else. If there is no justice, there is no else. Okay, and that's what our presence was there for. What is the or else? Okay, this is again our annual conference after um, Trump or on his way to being elected, the 2016 election and the struggle for self-determination. Yes, this is the start of our electoral school and how to take power over our lives through the political arena. This is the first BIB, first electoral campaign school in St. Petersburg last year. And you see the turnout, it was amazing. We also marched that year as well in Washington. We, under the ballot or the bullet, ballot and the bullet, not ballot or the bullet, it's ballot and yeah. the bullet. Yeah, that's right. And this was the one that we just recently had where Sister Coffey um, and uh, Robin Harris also attended and joined in. And this is, this is just, some of what the Black is Back has been involved in, just some. And now this is the time where we're gonna pledge, ask for our favorite part to keep it going. Our pledge goal today is 2,500, 2,500. Okay, let's see, well, well let's see. Uh, who in here wants to take us out with that 2,500 and we'll go right out the door for lunch? <laughs> okay, well here's our giving levels. Our first giving level is Queen Mother Yah. Yes, and I've heard many, many things about Queen Mother Yah. And um, we start with $1,000 here or more and she says, we must face it. While we have been marching for jobs, jobs have been marching out of this country in search of new slaves in foreign countries. Jobs are marching into prisons where they can legally work two million racially profiled black men and women to death again without pay. Well, I did want to ask if there was anyone here that did want to become a Queen Mother Yah sustaining member at a thousand dollars. Okay. Say that again. All right. Um, our next giving level is Chokwe Lumumba. And starting at $500, and Lumumba says, I only came to the movement because of King, and he was killed. I only stayed in the movement because of Malcolm, and he was killed. 
then I became the leader. Are there any Lumumba level donors today? $500. Our next giving level is Marcus Garvey at $365, which is equivalent to a dollar a day. A people without knowledge of their past history, origin, and culture is like a tree without roots. And we all know what happens. They'll fall. Do we have a Marcus Garvey donor today? Marcus Garvey, $365. On these uh, giving lists, uh, is any of this done in places or do people have to have all of that money right now? Oh, you can, no, absolutely. There are pledge cards in your folders that you can pledge. It does not have to be given now. Absolutely, thank you. Also, uh, people online can also pledge too. Right? Yes, people online are encouraged to pledge as well. Absolutely. All right, we got one Marcus Garvey here. Do we have another? And since you know that it does not have to be made right this minute in full, do we have any Queen Mother um, giving level donors? Okay. Chokwe Lumumbe. All right. And we have Marcus Garvey. Thank you, Diop. Our next giving level is Amiri Baraka. And we'll start there at $120 or more. We got Glenn Uhuru. This gentleman here, your name is? David, we have David. We have Lisa. Deputy Chair, DC Ona Uhuru. Do we have any more Amiri Baraka level giving donors? All right. Chairman? Chairman, thank you, thank you, thank you. A question. Yes. Suppose we do three memberships mm -hmm. international, $150. What does that get us? The Jericho movement, the provision from Jihad, the new abolitionist movement, mm -hmm. and the Lynn Stewart organization, 150 bucks. What do we get? That's what, what membership do you get? Oh, so based on this here, you're saying? That's 450, I believe. Yeah. Well, if you if put, yeah, but if, if you, no, if he adds, if he adds the 50, then you will be in the Chokwe Lumumba. Absolutely. Go, go back to Chokwe. He's 500. His. Oh, a piece. So, Amiri Baraka, yes, yes. Okay, yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, those are memberships. Um, Ralph, those are memberships. Separate from the giving levels. I want Chuck Okay, well. Well, you got Chokwe. All right, Ralph with Chokwe as well. Uh, Chokwe? Yeah. Chokwe. Okay. That's Ralph. Well, Next. Chokwe was what? Was 500. But I think two things are happening here. One, we were asking for people who would make a contribution as one thing. And the other thing is Ralph was asking about membership for Right, entities. that's it. The membership is different, it's and different from the, the right giving from the giving yeah, levels. Well, that it picked up in his contribution, hotel fees for some of our guests. Right. Mm. That was his donation. Okay. 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 Right. Personal cash, the functional cash. Okay. And our next giving level is Fannie Lou Hamer. And she says, nobody is free until everybody is free. And I know um, myself, I want to do Fannie Lou Hamer. Yes. 
Do we have any more Fannie Lou Hamer? Ma, mama, I love you, ma. I love you. My mom wants to become a Marcus Garvey level giver. And um, these are giving levels. All right, Yejade wants to become a Fannie Lou Hamer supporter. Do we have any more Fannie Lou Hamers? Uhuru. And this is, um, in addition to giving here, this is another um, way that you can make your donations. You can fill in the pledge form. You can email or you can go online and the information is here and we'll provide you with the information also on paper. And Uhuru, and thank you so much. Appreciate you. I know there are some people here who feel left out. You don't have to. If your amount was not called, we'll have somebody who will pass the basket now so we can take up other resources. Okay? I know, I know how it is to be left out. And we don't want that to happen. So, uh, do we have yet, did, was somebody calculating where we were in terms of uh, the resources? Not just yet, we have the um, Okay. Money. Would you yeah. give also uh, one of those little red things to uh, DC owner for me, uh, to $120? Okay. Do you want membership, right? Yeah. I'm sorry, Chairman. I didn't call for membership. Um, excuse me, but I called for resources, but I did not call for membership. Is there anyone here today that would like to join us in this fight, in this movement, to liberate our people? The form is in your folder. If you want to join us today, just fill out that form that's in your folder and give it, give it to us. Right. Well, yes, those who are already members and need to renew, you will renew. And those who want to join us will also fill out that form. Thank you. Yeah, renew if, if, if you, your membership is started at the national conference, if it's over. And I was, we pay every year at yes. the conference. So what is that, 200 or what? $200. So is there any other organization that, uh, or even individual whose membership has a starting point from the national conference other than ours? Uhuru. So, okay. And, and uh, you can calculate the 200 as a part of the income for today's thing, yes. you know, all right. And uh, Rashid will also indicate, and I also in terms of membership, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Comrade Raff was saying that he was dealing with membership for Jericho, is that right? Yes. And what, whatever. New Abolitionist, New Abolitionist Movement and Lynn Stewart Organization. Okay. All right, comrades, uh, where are we in terms of, is, is the bus here yet? And, and uh, is the little bag with our lunches here yet? Because we want to take them on the bus, if I'm not mistaken. Can you say some, comrades, so uh, we're going to do a tour now. And uh, there were comrades who were here last year, or who were here in April. And in the steering committee meetings, uh, it was discussed that it's not the best thing in the world for people to show up in, to St. Louis and then just come here and then leave without having seen anything. So uh, part of, uh, is T'Chara here? Or can you say anything to T'Chara about the tour?
can see that side of so we will be uh, having a tour. We wanted to give people the ability to see uh, some of St. Louis and the, uh, some important sites, or at least an important site in this case. Um, we are uh, nearing the anniversary of the murder of Mike Brown, and we thought it was fitting that we go to his memorial site. So we'll be taking a bus. We'll have a discussion around that, which will be led by President Columbia and Danette. Um, and so we want people, well, whenever we're released, to go ahead and get your food expeditiously if you uh, want to take a brown paper bag with you. And we're going to board the uh, bus as soon as, as quickly as we can so that we can have time to get there and really have a good discussion and get back to resume the program. Uh -huh. We will have someone here watching the building. Um, so, you know, if you want to leave it, that uh, someone will be here. One reason we want to go to Canfield Drive is because uh, there's some mystery to where Mike Brown died. And when they say he was walking in the street, people have come to certain kinds of assumptions about what that means. And we want you to see that location so that you can understand how absurd the uh, assault on Mike Brown was. Uh, on August uh, 9, 2014. So uh, why don't we break now? The bus uh, will be here momentarily, and I think there's a bag lunch. Can somebody help me? Is there a bag lunch that's here? Okay. Okay. So that's if, if people want to just go over to Canfield Drive, we'll do that. Other people just may want to chill. Uhuru. Oh, yeah, 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 no, right. 